Welcome to Page One, the show for writers with the reader in mind. Here's your host, Zeta Christian. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Page One. I'm Zeta Christian. My guest tonight is a very dear friend. We've known each other for many, many years, and she is, without a doubt, one of the most creative, talented women I've ever met. I'd like to introduce you to Laura Williams. Laura, thanks very much for being on the show tonight. My pleasure. We have so many things to talk about. I, when I think of you, I think of books, but I think children's books, picture books, young adult novels, um, adult adult novels, musicals, photography, uh, jewelry, so many, many different things. But we only have a half hour tonight, so we need to narrow it down to a couple things. And I thought, well, let's talk about the, the latest projects. Okay. So first, the book that is out most recently, Father Damien. Tell us about that book. Well, I've always been interested in Father Damien because I grew up in Hawaii, and he worked with the lepers in the 1800s uh, who were isolated on Molokai. They were put there so that they wouldn't spread the leprosy. And uh, I wrote a story about him a long time ago, but no publisher would publish it. They would write those lovely rejection letters. Yes. Yeah, I love the yeah. writing, but you know, basically, who's going to publish a book with pictures of disfigured people? in it for children. I mean, mm -hmm. basically that's what it came down to. So I didn't give up on the story because I always just, he just has a place in my heart. And so I went to Hawaii one summer and I thought, oh, I'm going to try some Hawaiian publishers. And that's exactly what happened. Um, oh. Yes. So it's published by a very small company that actually uh, produces a lot of different things. And one of the things they do is books. And they accepted the book. Now and who's the publisher? Um, whole, uh, yeah, good question. Island Heritage. Island Heritage. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, in, so you sub, you submitted to them. Was the process of submission anything different, you know, from what you usually do in a when you submit a proposal? No, I there were like three different publishers, and I sent the manuscript out to all three. Finished manuscript. Yep. Because it was a picture book, so it was only like five pages long. Oh. Yeah. And. Uh, they wrote back and said, you know, we're considering your manuscript. So you still get that same exciting thrill and everything. Uh, and then they finally did contact me and said that they wanted to publish it. And because they're such a tiny publisher, they, there was no advance or anything like that. It's all on royalty. So, so on a project like this, this really was more an effort of the heart. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't okay. even care if I ever make any money on this one. It really was a labor of love, and it was a long labor because I had sent in something to be a picture book, and then uh, they said, you know what, we're not doing so good with the picture books. Would you mind making it a lot longer and have it be an early reader book? So it's actually a chapter book now, with, so I had to come up with a lot more about his life to fill out the pages. Let's talk about a little about those divisions of books. So you have picture book is the first level, and that's for what? the type that the parent reads to the child with pictures in it. Right. That's actually, it, it depends. I mean, there's the basic, basic ones like my ABC book. That's like pure just picture. A kid can look at it. It only has one to a few words per page. Mm -hmm. The kid can go through it, you know, chew on it, whatever. Yeah. Uh, then there are the story books, and those are longer. Those are more like the Long Silk Strand, my book. And that one the parent has to read to the child. And also... Those are kind of universal. I mean, it, it, they appeal to adults as well. They sure do, especially that one. Yep. And uh, then there are the early readers or the chapter books. Those are for the kids who are emerging readers. That's like my grandson, who's seven. Right. And, yes. Okay. And, and then there are different levels within that. There's like the frog and toad books, which have like, you know, 10 words per page. And then there are the little bit longer, more sophisticated ones like Father Damien. And then you have the short novels, you know, all the way up through middle school and high school young adult novels. Okay, so we, we see the, the, the differences, um, the, the amount of words 
the number of words, number of pages. So let's go back here now. You originally were looking at a book, a Father Damien book as a picture book. Right. Okay, now they say to you, we want it to be a young reader's book. So we're talking expanding. Like, it doesn't seem like a lot, but maybe like I had to double or triple the size. So if it was only five pages, I had to make it 15. Okay, so it doesn't seem like that much, but I thought I had like pretty much said everything there was to say about him from the moment he stepped off the boat onto Molokai mm -hmm. to, you know, a couple weeks later. <laughs> I didn't want to go into all the gruesome aspects of the fact that he, you know, contracted the disease and things like that. He was there for like 16 years. So when I expanded it, I had to do a lot more research and it was absolutely fascinating to go back into his childhood. So I actually start with a scene from his childhood. I cover some of the time that he spent, uh, he grew up in Belgium, some of the time, I did too, some of the time he spent in his, uh, you know, learning to be a priest in Belgium and then finally getting transferred over to Hawaii and working on the big island before he actually went to Molokai. So from where I started, I went, you know, I had at least three chapters prior to that. What, what, was, the, what was the impetus? What, you know, what was the, the hook? Why the interest in him, other than the fact that, you know, he lived in, in an area where you lived? When I, growing up in Hawaii, the, uh, a statue came out and it was put in front of the state building on Oahu. And for some reason, I mean, I am artistic, so I was just drawn to it. It was a very odd statue, very square. I think maybe at a grand or, um, I, I, it was probably cast, but it was like a dark looking, very square shaped person with this hat on mm -hmm. that he's always depicted with. And I just remember being so interested in that and just kind of taken with the whole idea. And, and, and it's kind of a gruesome, sad story. And I guess I was always a little sick that way. <laughs> well, well, now that, that brings up an interesting point though. This is a sad story. I mean, there's, here's a man who spent his life, his adult life, caring for lepers, people who were outcasts mm -hmm. in society, and he contracted the disease himself. How did this publisher, how did they deal with the, the issues that all the other publishers that you know, they found to reject the book? I mean, this publisher wasn't afraid. So well, why, why do you think? It, because it's a Hawaiian publisher, I mean, Father Damien is an icon there. I mean, he, his statue is in front of the state capitol. I mean, he is amazing, you know. But did they, let you, did they let you have pictures or talk about the more gruesome aspects of the story, considering that this is a children's book? I didn't really go into, you know, no. I didn't really need to because my point wasn't to say, oh, it's so sad that these poor people. It was more about what love and life and selflessness Damien brought to his care of these people, and that's why he contracted the disease, because where nobody would touch them, he was changing their bandages and eating with them and doing things that everybody was like, no, 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 don't do this. But he couldn't help it. He, he had to be one of these people. He had, you know, how could he love them and preach to them if he, if he didn't hug them? So he contracted the disease. Right. Okay. And then he eventually died of it. And what has happened to his memory now? Well, just a month ago, he became a saint. And so I kept the title of the book, Father Damien, because that's how he is best known as. But now he is a saint. He was actually uh, made into a saint, I want to say, September 11th. But I don't think that's right. You're Something around that. Or October though. 11th. Something, yeah, yeah. So, Sorry, so do they call him Saint Damien or Saint Father Damien? You know, or? now he's Saint Saint Damien. He'll always be Father Damien to me. I mean, he used to be Brother Damien until he became a priest. Then he was Father Damien, and then he was like known as the Blessed because you have to go through several stages mm -hmm. in order to become a saint. Okay. And I'm not Catholic, so I don't really know what all the different you know divisions are. But but he made it. They had to prove that he did miracles. Miracles, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, and things like that. Well, you know, this being page one, I always ask if, if the guest is an author, I ask the author to read page one of the book. But in in your case, Laura, I do want to ask you to read from Father Damien, but n not 
page one, um, and we talked about this before the show. So mm -hmm. tell us about the place you're, the portion in the book you're going to read, and give us a little setup so we know what's gone on beforehand. Okay, it's actually the beginning of chapter two. Okay. In chapter one, there's a scene of Damien, and he used to be, his name, uh, you know, as a child was Joseph, or they called him Jeff. So there's a scene with his sister, and they're skating in Belgium on the frozen river, and he falls through the ice. It shows his bravery. It supposedly actually happened. But he was so stubborn, he wasn't going to drown in that freezing cold water. And, uh, you know, so he, he survived that. So in this next chapter, he's, you know, older. He's, he entered the priesthood because his older brother did, and he just always wanted to serve God. So I, always, I think people think of priests as being stern and, you know, fatherly and maybe stuffy. And the point about... Damien is that he was wonderful. So let me just read chapter okay. two. Um, and the chapter's called Still Laughing. Okay. Hush, Damien, Pam Fields said under his breath. You laugh too much. Damien, who was called Jeff as a boy, laughed harder. How can a person laugh too much? It's not seemly for a priest to laugh so often or so loudly. I'm not a priest yet. But you want to be. Pamphile said sternly. Damien tried to stop smiling, but it was difficult. He spread his arms wide and breathed deeply. Life was wonderful, so why shouldn't he laugh? Even though he tried to be more solemn and studious like his older brother, he couldn't help wondering whether God really minded if he laughed. Still, he did not want to do anything to hurt his chances of becoming a priest of the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary. This was something he had wanted to do for years. He was now called Brother Damien, and one day he wanted to become Father Damien. He studied hard and prayed as often as he could. When someone was hungry, he willingly gave up his food. He even slept on the hard floor without a mattress to prove his devotion to God. The difficult part was holding back his laughter. Sometimes it just burst out of him before he could stop it. He hid his grin behind his hand. Yes, Pamphile, you're right. I'll try to behave myself. Pamphile nodded. Good. There's hope for you yet. Then even he smiled. Though only God knows how. Damien reached over and hugged his brother. Pamphile pulled away, sighing. Be careful, brother. You'll crush me to death, he said, rubbing his shoulders. Sometimes I think you don't even know your strength. It's from lifting all those bags of grain on the farm, Damien said with a quick grin. I'll need my strength when I'm called to do God's will. Strength of spirit and mind, Pamphile said, not strength of muscle. Damien shrugged. We'll see, was all he said. Wonderful. Okay, so we're getting a, a little glimpse of him before the start of the story that most of us know exactly, about him. Exactly, exactly. And, and it really portrays very well that he did laugh, and he was known. You know, the literature that I did read about him, um, he did laugh a lot. He, you know, that, and that's why uh, his patients were, were drawn to him, his congregation. And, uh, and he was very strong. I mean, that was said over and over again. You know, when he fell through the ice, he was able to save himself because he was so strong. And he needed his strength, and that's why it's, you know, it's a little foreshadowing to say, Oh, well, we'll see if my muscles will do any good because, yeah. oh, yes, he, he needed his strength quite a bit when he was living on, in Hawaii. What, now, this, this age range, let's, I'm thinking my grandson, seven, eight, nine, mm -hmm. ten, is that about the Yes, it, on the back range? it says seven to ten, so yeah, okay. I'm right about that. What, what's, if, if there were one thing that you would want a young reader to take away from this story, what do you think it would be? Well, perhaps two things. One would be a general thing that segregation of any kind is wrong. Because basically what the Hawaiian government or kingdom at the time did was take anybody who had any signs of leprosy, which is now, by the way, called Hansen's disease. It's not called leprosy, but because it was at that time, I do refer to it like that. Um, but they, they stuck them on a little piece of land surrounded by violent ocean, and the highest sea cliffs in the world. So they could not escape. They were segregated. 
so that that's just you know so many different ways that that's wrong and the second thing is that it was, he was a wonderful wonderful person and I think everybody has the potential to be that that's a good message now we have here in the studio a beautiful picture I'm gonna get get this up here for the uh, camera when you as a writer write the story but then the publisher comes up with the cover and if it's a picture book the mm -hmm. illustrations right but I do want to get a shot of this and have you tell us what are we looking at here that is actually the original painting that Karen Klofsky who is the illustrator for this book did for the front cover and I be, just because I do love you know Father Damien so much and I love that he's so young in this picture we, we often see photographs of him when he was quite a bit older and already contracted the disease so he looks rather misshapen um, so I wish in a way he had a little bigger smile there but but I love that painting and so I purchased it actually from the artist and she lives in Hawaii oh, okay so this this is the painting the artist creates the painting, mm -hmm. then the artist gives it to the publisher. Mm -hmm. Publisher uses the painting to create the cover of the book. That's right. how that works. Yep. Okay. Well, the artist must have been thrilled that you loved the painting that much to to purchase the cover. Yeah. That's and uh, in fact, for one of the other books that we're going to talk about, I also bought another painting. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Well, it gets expensive. <laughs> yeah, that does. I bet it does. But I mean, these are. Th th this is just the an artistic memento of the the other portion of a, when you're doing a book that is so that's heavily pictured mm -hmm. you know, picture laden or particularly right. for the cover I know several other authors of of adult books who have, who have purchased the paintings that were used for the covers so speaking of other books let's talk about slant okay so slant um, interesting title interesting word tell us where the title came from first and then tell us what the story's about well, it's funny because before the book was published, uh, one of the people from the publishing company, Milkweed Editions, which is a small uh, nonprofit, believe it or not, publisher in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. had a deep conversation with me about the title, Slant. They were, th they were wondering if that would be offensive in any way. Slant is actually a very derogatory term for anybody of Asian descent. Mm -hmm. And so... It could be construed by some as being very racist, mm -hmm. but I was very, I, I really wanted to keep it because not only is it, you know, the slant of a person's eye, which is what it rep it's supposed to represent, but it's also, you know, a different way to look at something, something that's at a slant. You know, you've just got to look at things a little bit differently sometimes, and that's important. Yes. But, but that whole idea, the fact that there's a, a, a racist connotation to the word plays into the story too, doesn't it? Very much so. Okay, it's tell us about, about the story. It's about an Asian, uh, a girl who was adopted from Korea. I was adopted from Korea. Mm -hmm. Her name is Lauren Wallace. Laura Williams. Okay. okay. A couple parallels. Uh, and she, in growing up in Connecticut, her father works at Trinity, uh, she's teased. She lives in a neighborhood where uh, the other kids call her gook. They call her... Uh, you know, slant. There's one scene where some boys tell her to put chops, uh, that would be very, even more painful, uh, toothpicks in her eyes to keep them open. And that was all things that were said to me when I was growing up. And so, you know, you just, you kind of always have that. And so that's, and oh, so she's very upset about that. So she saved all her money, and she wants to have an operation on her eyes to make them more uh, Caucasian-looking. And how old is she in the story? Thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And can you tell us a little bit more about what happens there? Well, actually, it's funny because I was just doing a book signing. And so as people were walking by, I would tell them, you know, and I'd say, oh, and the girl, and, and I say, it's very autobiographical, and the girl really saving her money to do, um, you know, the eye surgery. And they all kind of look at me, and I say, oh, but I didn't do the surgery, you know. I, I'm half Asian, so maybe my eyes don't look as, you know, Asian, but that was kind of funny. Um, so 
you know, she's involved with, she has a boy that she likes, she has a best friend who's gorgeous, you know, and nobody ever teases her. They might tease her about being too tall and gorgeous and thin, you know. Um, you know, it's just a typical teenage girl, except that she's got a huge self-image problem. But who doesn't? Yeah. You know, especially kids, and kids can be so mean to each other. They really can. That old thing about sticks and stones, um, yes. they may break my bones, but words will never, well, they do hurt. They words do hurt, hurt and bullying is such a big thing. Um, racism is a huge issue to just talk about, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I'm not saying racism is a big issue. That's a whole other story? story. No, I'm talking about in life in oh. general. Uh, you know, I teach in Manchester, so anyway. You, so yeah, you teach high school I English. I do, yes. Okay. And um, so I actually want to teach this book because I do think it's a way to talk about, you know, calling people names and making fun of other races and cultures. And so I do always try to share with my students, you know, that's not nice. You know, don't make fun of people for whatever. It's just, it can be so painful and hurtful and stay with you for the rest of your life. What's the age range for the reader, recommended reader this for this book? This is kind of like uh, middle school, they say. So that's what, six, seven, eight? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, you know, I think it's interest level for anybody, even in yes. high school. Yeah. I agree. Now, you have another one, another book I want to talk about tonight, and we don't have a finished book because it hasn't been published yet, correct? Right. Okay, and the title of that book? This is The Can Man. Okay, and, and what are we looking at here since, this, since the book itself is not finished? This is called A Proof, and what happens is that the publisher, now all the art has been done, so the publisher then prints uh, not very many copies, because they want to look at the color and they give them to the artist and the artist decides, you know, if the colors look good. I, of course, think it looks fabulous, but the illustrator told me that, you know, things look a little gray to him, this, that, and the other thing. So, you know, he's going to have things fixed. Uh, but it's about a boy who wants a new skateboard for his birthday, but his family can't afford it. So he has to come up with a way to make money. So he decides, he sees a homeless man collecting cans, and he lives, you know, in a city-type area. So he decides that he's going to collect cans for his skateboard. Okay. And do you want me to ruin the story for you? No, I don't <laughs> want you to ruin the story. But the, but the couple things here. We're, we're seeing this is what a book looks like before it is actually processed. You have a cover flat, and you have these separate sheets of paper. Right. Now, when the book is actually put together, well, when will it be out? When, when in, the the spring. in the spring. Spring of 2010. Right. Okay, and what's the age range for this story? Again, because it, it has a little bit more text than just, you know, you know the dog chased the cat, um, it's, pr it's a storybook, so kindergarten, first grade, you know, it's, okay. it's for sharing with an adult, probably, who's going to read it to you. Okay, the, now the, the first, when we talked about Father Damien, the very, very definitely there, a, a message behind there about treating people, not, not discriminating uh, against people uh, for an illness, not segregating people. And when we talked about slant, we're also talking there's a discrimination mm -hmm. that is going on here too because of uh, ethnicity and physicality. What's the, the, um, the moral, the imprint, the message, the thumbprint behind the story here of the Can Man? Yeah, I guess it's economics, you know, uh, because it says in here that the Can Man used to live in their apartment building. And, uh, and, and at one point, the two converse, and, you know, the boy's like, well, what are you saving? What are you saving your canned money for, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, well, maybe a new coat. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, you know, he wants a skateboard. So it's a little bit different, survival versus, yeah, I want a new toy. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and he used to be, who knows why? And, and in this economy, you know, it's kind of... Sadly, perfect timing. Yes, it, it is, unfortunately. And I think it's a really good, it, it's a nice time that we're talking about this. You know, it's, um, it's a nice holiday message. I, I say message, but I don't want to give away the story, but just to say that, you know, to talk about values. 
yes. about what's important. Right. Okay. Now I want to get uh, into something here that um, we've touched on just briefly. I know you as not only an author, but a phenomenal artist and a photographer as well. And yet, for your books, though you wrote them, you had nothing to do with the artwork, either with the cover or with books, any of the artwork on the inside. Tell us about how that works for writing children's books, because I have to tell you, Laura, we meet a lot of people because of the show. People will stop me in the grocery store or um, in any number of places, and I find many, many people want to write children's books. That's that's the big Well, they, know, think, the it's goal. they think it's easy because they're short. They think it's easy because it's short. And then they also think that they're going to find a friend or to do the pictures, or they're going to do the pictures themselves. Or their Tell kid. Us, or their, yes, I've seen that happen. <laughs> yes. Tell us how that really works. Well, you send in the manuscript to an editor, and you do not say, my mother will illustrate this for me, or I've done pictures and my mother thinks they're wonderful, or my neighbor is like going to art school, she will do the illustrations. No. You send in the manuscript. The editor, if she decides to buy has in her head already all the different illustrators that she has been, you know, looking at the portfolios and thinking about because it's the editor who chooses, not the art director. Mm. And so she will, oh, okay, and it, it speaks to her. So it's kind of like her creation. It's her marriage of the writing and some illustrator. And she's very much in charge of hiring the illustrator, choosing, um, you know, like once the illustrator makes the pictures, and, uh, the paintings or whatever, has to decide um, what changes need to be done and things like that. Luckily, with the Can Man, and actually with Father Damien too, I was able to see artwork before it was published so that I could give my two cents worth. You oh, know? that's nice, because usually the usually author doesn't Usually you, can, you can't point. see anything until the book is yeah. published. Laura, I'm, I'm, I'm dismayed to say that we are getting the signal that our, our time is up. And I had other questions to ask. I wanted to get you to pull a we question get from to do the, the basket. basket. Well, we'll have to c come back. You have to come back again because you've also, with some friends, written a musical. And I know there are a number of other projects that, you know, we'll talk about. But certainly Father Damien, Slant, and the Can Man are the three, the three current things yes. for you. So yeah. we'll be sure to let the, you know, let the public know um, about those. And... Uh, I also want to say, obviously, a thank you to you for sharing all this with us tonight. A thank you to my crew and to you in the viewing audience. Please, remember the words of Ursula again, who said, There have been civilizations that did not use the wheel, but there have been no civilizations that did not tell stories. So find your story and find a way to tell it. And do join us again next time. Thank you. Food for the crew and guests was provided by Manchester Grill of Manchester, Connecticut and Angelo's Restaurant of Glastonbury, Connecticut. Be sure to send your writing questions and your comments on the book club selection to Zeta at page 1, P.O. Box 1515, Manchester, Connecticut, 06045-1515, or send an email to zeta at page1tv.com. <laughs>